As we begin this morning, I want to begin with a thought, and uh, we don't have a lot of time. I feel like God has given me more, more to say, but time doesn't always increase, so I have to start speaking up, which is hard for me, or going fast, because I want to slow down and stretch words out, like the wheel of God. I want to say it like that, but then we have to say the wheel, the wheel, to keep moving forward. So here it is, at the beginning, uh, if we keep our character, we don't have to recover it. If we maintain these things, if we, we keep after ourselves, we don't have to recover it. However, if you're in a place where you need to recover your character, we want you to recover your character. And at that point, we want you to keep it and maintain it. Job, through all the trials he went through, he did not give up his integrity. He kept his integrity along the way. Now, with much anticipation, I was hoping uh, to get into part of the series that we have talked about in dealing with church and culture, and, and next week I'm going to begin with what Paul talks about to his uh, protege, Timothy, as he's raising up this young pastor and conveying ideas of what the end times is going to look like. And I don't have it on the screen this morning. I want to share this. And if you, if you have time this week, I'd like for you to read ahead and look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. And verse 1 actually says this, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. And we're going to get into the idea of last days, eschatos there, um, where we get eschatology. It's a fancy word that you go away to college and spend lots of money to learn. When we can just learn at the local church, eschatology, um, meaning the end things. But what I want to convey from the beginning is that Paul, the New Testament writers, were saying that we are already in this. We are in the eschatos. And in this time, there's going to be difficulty, times of difficulty. And the understanding of the word is that there's going to come times of troublesome, uh, things that are hard to bear, and things that are dangerous. And we're going to talk about the ideologies that have come into our culture and that have come into the church and how uh, they came to be and how we are to deal with them. And just to remind everybody today, the answer to apostasy at any time is always the word of God. Uh, we were singing about the firm foundation. The answer of this, the gospel is the answer for people to know, to be saved. The gospel is what we teach God's word to our children to be discipled. That is the answer. But I was compelled for one more week to remain in the book of Judges here. And, and in Judges, we've talked about this. We see um, there are, there's disobedience. They are disobedient and idolatrous people who repeatedly oppressed by their enemy. Now, this is their own doing. We talked about that last week. The people would go and worship the false idols. They would live in sin. God would allow, God allows you to go the direction you want to go. The oppressors come. The enemies would come, and, and people were in hard times, hard economical times, physical problems, challenges, warfare. All these things are taking place. Then we, they would realize, this is not working out for us. This is pretty bad. They would call out to God. God would respond, and God would raise up a judge. At times, we learned last week, God sent a prophet and the angel of the Lord appeared, but God would raise up a judge. And during this time period in the book of Judges, one of the recurring verses, I don't have it on the screen, it says, in those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. This is kind of what we're seeing in our own culture, and part of the reason I wanted to get into this today as well is that the rise of the modern self is everyone trying to do what pleases them. And in the text we will get into next week, it says people become lovers of self, of self rather than lovers of God. There's a transition. God doesn't matter anymore, and it's just how I feel and what I want to do. But this is not a new idea in the world. But during this time of the judges, God would send a judge, basically a temporary leader to settle disputes and at times deliver God's people from the enemies. And at this part in the scripture, we are going to look at Samson. We're going to be in Judges chapter 13 this morning. Let's go ahead and stand as we read the word of God this morning. Judges chapter 13 will be in 13, 14, and 16 this morning. And the people of Israel, again, recurring word here, again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. 
There was a certain man of Zorah, of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren, and she had no children. The angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore be careful, drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean. And behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. The woman bore a son toward the end of the chapter here and called his name Samson. And the young man grew and the Lord blessed him. The spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Mahane, Dan, between Zorah and Eshtaol. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we love you and we, Lord, we pause as the Psalms teach us, Selah, that we meditate on you. We breathe in who you are. And we pray this morning, as we know already in Isaiah 55, that your word goes out. It does not return void. But we pray that your good word, your good seed, falls on good ground today. We pray for any of those who are distracted, that their thoughts would be gathered in to focus on you. Those who may not believe in you yet, that your word is planted or implanted into their heart that they may be saved. And Lord, we pray also, Lord, for those who may have drifted or trying to figure out what's going on, Lord, that they would be planted on the firm foundation of who you are to give up the evil ideologies of the world, false doctrine, uh, the cares of this world, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Lord, we pray that people repent from these things and they come to your truth. And Lord, we pray again that you give us eyes to see. Lord, that you give us spiritual ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to the 21st century church. And Lord, that we are born again, that we must be born again, that we can see the kingdom. We pray for that new birth and uh, new life in us today. And Lord, that we continue to pursue you. Lord, we dedicate our lives to you. We, have, we pray that you help us in discipling all people, that they may continue to follow you, not easily led astray by the enemy. And Lord, that our character, our integrity is not easily corrupted by the world. Bless your words in Christ's name. Amen. Church, you may be seated. As we look at the life of Samson, I want you to know out of all um, Old Testament or biblical characters, he had great beginnings. He had the greatest potential. I mean, he had a wonderful beginning. And, and that's the story of many people that I know. They will say that I grew up in church. I went to VBS and I got saved. I went to church camp. I began to follow the Lord. But something happened along the way. And so we're going to see that something happens in the life of Samson, even though he had a wonderful beginning, but there's a slow corruption of Samson's character along the way. So the first thing we're looking at, church, is that Samson, he had faith. That is the faith of Samson in Judges chapter 13 and verse 5, and behold, you shall conceive you will bear a son, the razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and you shall begin, he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Now you see here in chapter 1, actually it is the angel of the Lord who comes to Manoah's wife and speaks to her. We believe this is not just a messenger of the Lord, we believe this angel to be a pre-incarnate Christ. You can go back and read through the text here to see a little more of the details as they want to bring an offering like Gideon did, as we learned last week, to uh, the angel of the Lord. He says, I'm not going to eat these things, but there's a measure of worship. They're bringing worship or um, you know, the sacrifice to the angel of the Lord. And when he ascends into heaven, Manoah said, he fears for his life. He says, we have seen God, that they saw something different about this angel. So Samson's parents received word from Christ that they're going to have a miraculous child. And this child was to be special. Uh, he would show significance at a young age. The Holy Spirit is stirring in his life. And he has an obvious connection, or in this, I want you to know there's no obvious connection to the term Nazarene. What we're seeing here is that there is a Nazarite 
vow or dedication that is taking place. You can look more into that in Numbers chapter 6. There's three things in being a Nazarite. One is that he is not to drink strong drink or any fermented drink, anything that is strong and alcoholic that would give you a buzz or make you drunk. He's not supposed to touch uh, grapes or grape juice or the vine, nothing of the vine, raisins or anything. It's pretty strict. He was not to touch anything unclean, no dead bodies, anything like that, and he wasn't supposed to cut his hair. In fact, this is so strict. This is, a, this is different. Most times it's people who choose to be a Nazarite. They're, they're taking a vow. And this, it is a dedication to be a Nazarite at this point. And it was so strict that the mother was not supposed to drink or do anything uh, while she was pregnant with him. The very word here you see Nazarite is from the term Nazir, which means to consecrate, or from the root word uh, Nazar, for, or meaning to separate. So in this vow, you're giving up these things I don't want these other things that may be pleasurable for others. I'm, I'm taking this strict vow. I'm giving up things of the world that I can be consecrated fully to God. So made holy and separate from the world, and at this point, for this particular person, to be a warrior for God. In verse 5, I don't have it on the screen. Samson is dedicated to God basically from his birth. I mean, even before he's born. This is a special, not only is he a miraculous child, there's a special calling on this child's life that is before he is born into the world. And he would be a leader in defending and delivering the, um, Israel from the Philistines. And I would say that any birth is miraculous here. But this woman, she could not have a child. So there's some special things taking place as they're preparing for Samson to come into the world. Now, many children have been raised in the faith. Um, uh, God has given you the gift of children, and we are to dedicate them to God as early as possible if we have dedicated our lives to God. And I, really, I believe in that. I believe we are to dedicate our children to God. I think we see this in the scriptures that we're dedicating our family and that we are discipling them. So it doesn't stop at dedication. We are to dedicate. It's not just a ceremony where we bring a kid forward. In fact, I've told parents over the years, it's not that you're merely dedicating your child, that you are dedicating your life to this child, that I'm going to raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. This is my duty that I'm taking on, that I'm going to live this life as I teach my child and disciple them. So here it is. Samson had a special gifting and calling on his life. He is a protector. Uh, this is his mission. In fact, they ask the angel of the Lord, what will be his mission? And I want you to know this morning that anyone that God has called, that he saves, they have a mission. Every Christian that believes in God, you're to be saved and sanctified. God sanctifies us to prepare you for a special work. We all are missionaries. We're all called to a mission and some things more specific than others as God is calling us into his mission in the world. And so he shows signs of significance at a young age. He grew, the Bible tells us, the Lord has blessed him and the spirit of the Lord began to stir him. And I pray to God that we are getting so close to the Lord in our life, wherever you are in your walk, in your faith, in your development, regardless of how long you've been in the church, that God is stirring you again. That you sense that in your spirit. That it's not just, I, I go to church and I go home, come and go home church kind of mentality. It's that God is stirring me throughout the week. Something is different. I want more of God in my life, and he's revealing things to me that need to change as we are becoming a holy people. So here it is, church. Samson had wonderful beginnings. He had wonderful parents that were faithful. You will see that there is a contrast. If you were to go back and look at Gideon, his parents were idolaters. They're worshiping. They have a community worship center for everybody to come and worship Baal and the Asherah. And God called the least or the youngest of the family to go interrupt that. Here it is. It's different. This, this judge has wonderful beginnings, faithful parents that God, that God spoke to and had... Um, had a time with God, a special time with God. So God has had his hand on Samson from the beginning. Samson's family were faithful people. But just because we have good upbringings does not mean we're not going to face temptations along the way. 
Uh, we have watched over the years where people uh, started out in the faith, they were excited, they wanted to become missionaries or work in ministry, and something happens along the way, but it's not just one event. I believe it is a slow fade, and it's a series of things that begin to happen in their lives. The next thing you'll see, not only does Samson have faith, there is an utter failure in Samson's life. Chapter 14. Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. You're beginning to see that um, Samson loves to look at women. And he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Uh, now go get her for me, because she's very pretty. That's basically what he's saying here. You've got to read into the Hebrew here, and it doesn't take a lot of study to know what, what is going on. Samson has seen many women. And he saw one that looked really good, and he wants mom and dad to go fetch her so they can get married. And the problem is here, the Philistines are the enemies. A, a biblical understanding is that a faithful, a believer, is not to marry an unbeliever. It's going to be problematic in the family. Maybe some of you guys have experienced along the way that. Or maybe you were married before you came to faith and one person came to faith along the way. Maybe the other one is not. There's going to be some challenges. We encourage people not to marry someone that is not of the faith. But here it is. They're upset. And you would think that. Uh, Samson, we have brought you up in the faith. And you want to marry a Philistine. There's a problem here. But if you were to read through the text, it actually says that this was of the Lord. God wanted Samson to position himself closer to the Philistines so he could have an occasion to defeat the Philistines. So here it is, though. This begins a downward spiral of events for Samson. Skipping over to chapter 16 and verse 1, there's a bunch that happens where this marriage doesn't work out if you get into chapter 16 and verse 1, it says, Samson goes to Gaza, and he's what, church? He sees a prostitute, and he goes in to be with her. There, here it is, this great man of God that is to defend Israel from the enemies is now giving in to the flesh. And here it is, there's going to be problems along the way. Samson had a lustful heart and eye issue here. And you may remember the song from our youth, Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. We must be very cautious today. Out of all things and all cultures and all places in the world, we have everything that we want at our fingertips, and we can see what we want to see. In fact, it is very hard to unsee what is available for us today. But men and women of the faith must reclaim their eyes, that we guard our eyes, You'll see Job 31.1 here, I made a covenant with my eyes. I took this serious. I recognized that I have problems. I got down and I, I, I met with God and I actually made a covenant with my body. You know to say if you actually write down your goals, you have a better chance of accomplishing those goals. That you would take and, and get alone and say, you know what, I'm going to make a covenant with myself. I'm going to set some goals and some objectives for myself that I'm not going to look lustfully at a young woman. And here it is, church. Men and women need to be careful of their eyes and what they look at, that we guard our eyes, we guard our, our mind, we guard our heart. It is easy to get wrapped up and see, and it is easy actually to say, well, they shouldn't be dressing that way. Well, one group shouldn't be dressed in a certain way, and another group shouldn't be looking. So here it is. At the same time, we must be cautious and guard ourselves along the way. But here it is. We must be careful how we look and guard what we're looking at. The next thing you're going to see that happens in Samson's life is that he began to linger around things that were forbidden. He's patrolling the border of where the Philistines are, and they come over and fight, and, and then they fight them off, and they're, they're battling, and, and he begins to linger in places as he travels, as he's coming and going in places he shouldn't be. He began to linger around things that were forbidden. And they came to the vineyards of Timnah. Uh, obviously, he has seen the woman, and the woman in Timnah are going down to fetch this woman, and they're traveling together as a family. And behold, a young lion came toward him, roaring. The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. And although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one who tears a young goat. And here it is. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. This text reveals the potential of Samson's power. 
the Spirit of the Lord would come upon him. And, and you see this, I mean, just to know that somebody could rip anything like that. You remember those strong guys that would come to churches and stuff and they'd rip a phone book in half? And you're like, man, they're strong. They'd actually cut a little line in it, I found out later. They'd cut a little piece, to get, a, get a little starter along the way. You know, I tried to do those. Hulk Hogan ripped his shirt open. You know, you've seen that guy over the years. And I've, I was like, yeah, I was like, ugh. <laughs> So you know they put something in there along the way. Samson didn't have a problem with this. And so there's a mystery to his strength. How could anyone just rip a lion here? But as the family, they're, they're traveling. They're, it's a caravan. It's not like today we have a caravan that we all get into as a family. They would travel in caravans and groups of people, and they're traveling. Of course, the parents are not with Samson at this time. He's an adult. But you can think back of the life of Jesus when his family would travel to Jerusalem for, to make sacrifices or for the special um, the feast along the way. And, and uh, the parents didn't know where Jesus was all the time. In fact, they were three days into traveling back home before they realized where Jesus was. And that's kind of frightening today, but if you ever felt like a bad parent, you didn't lose your kid for three days. Uh, and so here it is. They're traveling together. And along the way, Samson's in a place he shouldn't be. He's approaching this vineyard. Uh, he has taken a detour. And in fact, he's making a detour from his Nazarite vow. But I want you to see something very important this morning, church. Samson was somewhere where he didn't need to be, and this lion shows up. Throughout the years, I've prayed with many people that have had many problems or they're trying to come out of something or something happened in their life, and nine times out of ten, someone, somebody was where they didn't need to be or doing something they shouldn't do. I, we have to get to a place where maybe you're invited to something and it's okay to say no. You know, sometimes Christians are looked at as being judgmental or rigid, but it's better to say no and, to, and, and, and better than getting into a place where then you have to fight off temptation all the more where you're in the place you shouldn't be. Samson is nearing something he shouldn't be near, this, this vineyard here where the lion shows up. But here it is again, there's, there's a mystery with his strength, and this is going to unfold more along the way. And you see that he doesn't tell his parents. Now, obviously, if he said this happened, they're going to say, where were you? Where was this lion? We want to see it. So he doesn't tell his parents because he was somewhere he shouldn't be. You know, young adults, um, I've, I've worked with young people over the years, and I've had kids of my own, and kids are not always honest. In fact, I was watching a talk this week on lying and how you can spot a liar. And uh, the person is speaking to a room, and they said, look to your right. So you guys can look to your right. Uh, there's a liar there. And you can look to your left. And guess what? There's a liar there, and actually in your seat presently, there is a what? Uh, there is a liar. And they're going into this uh, understanding of how our culture lies and who lies, and they said out of five meetings that a young adult may have with their parent, four out of the five times together, the young adult is lying, statistically. Uh, they're not wanting to tell everywhere they've been and what they've been doing. So how was your week? Oh, it was good. Went to the coffee shop. All right, there's, a, there's 168 other hours in the week there. Uh, there's a lot happening. So not everybody wants to tell where they were because there's going to be questions along the way. Samson was going down the wrong way and drifting into places he shouldn't be. He didn't want to tell his parents. And for us as believers, we must be cautious of where we go. If we're going down the wrong road, we need to find a new road along the way that we are not easily tempted. Um, today, uh, people may, in the workplace, venture down a hall or through a certain area where cubicles are where someone is they want to flirt with. Somewhere where they get a little more attention and we make our way into that area to get some flirtation along the way. We should not go down that way. You know, it used to be office temptation was in the office and then you were home. But now the office finds its way into the home through the iPhone. We have an iPhone, we have an iPad, we have all these devices today, and temptation now is in our hand. And people now flirt and go to places they shouldn't go on our devices, in our culture of technology. We must be careful of where we are going and that we should be careful of these things. In fact, I had a friend who had a little sticker that he would give people. It said, now entering the mission field. And he would hand it out to put it on your phone or your laptop or your iPad or whatever it may be to remind people, I'm going into the mission field. 
that part of this is my mission and I don't want my character to be corrupted. The next thing that Samson did, he began touching that which was forbidden. And he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion and behold, coming back as he's traveling back through, behold, there's a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and now there's honey. There's, some time has passed. He scraped it out into his hands and went on eating as he went and he came to his father and mother and gave some to them and they ate but again did not tell them that he had scraped it from the dead carcass. Oh, we must be careful what our hands touch today. The church, there's a lot of problems with us understanding what sin is. We've kind of reduced sin into uh, we must keep the Ten Commandments and nothing more. So somebody can live a life as the rich young ruler in the New Testament that comes to Jesus, and he says, how can I inherit the kingdom of God? And he says, well, tell me about the commands. Have you kept? Yeah, I've kept all those since my youth. I haven't murdered. I haven't done any of these things. And so we think because we keep the ten that there's no other sins that we can break. There's sins in breaking a command that God may call you to do something. If God is calling you to do a mission or a service or to get rid of something in your life, it might not necessarily be a sin, but it becomes a sin when you don't do what you're supposed to do. James in the New Testament says, if you know what to do and you don't do it, it is a sin. But still, it's kind of hard at times for us to understand, and I think Susanna Wesley helps us understand this. John Wesley would write his mother and ask her, what is sin? And she breaks it down very good for us today. Whatever weakens your reason impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, takes off your relish of the spiritual things. We're seeing that in our culture, the relish of being in the house of God and being a part of Bible studies and being in the community of faith, the relish of spiritual things. Whatever increases the authority of the body over the mind, that thing is sin to you, however innocent it may seem in and of itself. Samson was lingering where he shouldn't, it became sin for him. He began touching what he shouldn't along the way. Now, there's something I wanted to share that I shared with first service here. In our culture, we are seeing something that I would call the rise of the anti-hero. Taylor Swift sings a song about the anti-hero. I am the anti-hero. There is an, allure, an appeal to be a hero, but not the traditional kind. Not the kind that would give up evil or be the person of character or integrity. It is the person that, you know, we, people today, they like to say they want to be like a Viking and they talk about Vahara and all the, the heaven thing. They want to be the guy with the big beard that goes to the bar with the guys that beats the enemy, kills and utterly destroys the enemy, gets drunk with the guys and sleeps around and we think that's heroic today and it's not. That is what we would say is toxic Christianity. That's not Christianity. If anything, God calls us to Christ's likeness, not to be the anti-hero type. Do not buy into that reality today. That is the, 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 the Tate today, the Andrew Tate, who would, uh, he acts masculine. I'm the tough guy, but he's a womanizer. So people are watching his video because people desire masculinity today. But there is a godly masculinity the one who would protect his family, the one who would go to work. And, and masculinity is guarding your family and raising your family to love the Lord. Don't give in to the false ideologies of the culture that wants you to be this, this tough guy who does everything just like the world and his life is going to crumble in sin as his character is corrupted. That is the draw today. And here it is, Samson's story is a sad story. They go to this wedding ceremony. They're traveling down to Timnah to have this wedding to meet this woman he has seen. And there's going to be a drunken fest. And Samson is most likely involved in all this partying. To what extent, we don't know. And, and he's got these Philistines there. And everybody's there for this party. And I've been at weddings before. And, and when people start bringing out the drink, I, I depart. I'm not going to be a part of that nonsense. I've seen it over the years. But he, he challenges them. You've seen when people get together and they have a beer in one hand. And they're like, come on, man, let's do this. You've seen it in culture. Hey, man, hold my beer. And that never ends up in a good way. We understand that. You get, you get what I'm saying. So he comes up with this idea. I have this riddle he's going to present to the Philistines. And if they can answer it within seven days, they're going to get a lot of money and a lot of clothes. And what is the riddle? Out of the eater, something to eat. And out of the strong, something sweet. 
Well, they're struggling to figure this out. They're upset, so they go to Samson's wife and father-in-law-to-be, and they're begging for this, and they threaten to kill them if they don't get the answer. So the wife goes to Samson and begs him, please, you, you won't tell me this. He says, I've not even told my parents this secret. I can't tell you. And she begins to, to, to vex his spirit. He's, he gets fed up. He's not necessarily a godly man. He's, he's losing his temper. He's like, all right, then, I'll tell you. And he gives her the answer. Well, the Philistines come to her, and they get the answer, and they come to Samson on the seventh day, and they give him the answer. And he knows at that point, someone has been with my wife. And he says, someone has plowed with my wife, is what he says. We don't know the whole story of what happened there. He's upset, and he says, now I have an occasion. I have a reason to, 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 to hinder or to hurt the Philistines. And he runs and gathers 300 foxes. Now here it is. There's a mystery to his strength. You always see paintings and drawings of Samson as this big, muscular guy. But he is fast enough to catch 300 foxes. How, how, raise your hand if you've ever seen a fox. And you didn't see it long, did you? It's, pew, it's gone. He grabs 300 of those, ties them together by the tail, uh, ties a torch in there, and it is wheat season. It's wheat harvest season. You could see that's happening out by my house. It is dry. They run, run through with these torches, and the wheat harvest is burning up. The Philistines are upset. They kill Samson's uh, wife-to-be and, and father-in-law, and, and so you see these horrible things taking place, and then he wants to retaliate, and, and the people there end up, uh, some of the Israelites or the people there are giving Samson back to the enemy. He escapes. He kills a thousand people with a jawbone. There's this weird, these, these weird battles that are taking place, and people doing what is right in their own eyes, and, and Samson, the enemy, wants to kill him. But there's a mystery to Samson's strength, and the Philistines want to know it. And then you have the entrance of Delilah. He's going to openly reveal secrets to the enemy here. So again, as he's patrolling the border, it says that he meets a woman named Delilah. So Delilah, over time, would say to Samson, tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Now the Philistines have come to Delilah. To, to, he, they offer her money. Now, this is not a marriage situation. Uh, we think hookup culture is something new. Hookup culture was taking place at this time as well. And so the Philistines have offered Delilah money to go into Samson to find out what is the secret of this strength. Why do they need to know this? There's this unusual strength that Samson has. Oh, church, we should be careful what our mouth has to say. Now, Delilah here is not the one that you've heard out west here, Delilah on the radio. Um, it's not like that at all. This romantic person you call into in the evening to listen to on the radio. By the way, that Delilah has been married three or four times, so I don't know what she's been teaching over the years. Maybe she's got a lot to do with the Delilah here. We don't know the whole story there. But here it is, church. Let's not show the hand of what God is doing in our life to the enemy. He's been working his way down this path he shouldn't go, seeing things he shouldn't see, tasting and touching things he shouldn't touch and taste. Now he's revealing things he shouldn't reveal. And he's not only sleeping with the enemy, he's sharing secrets with the enemy. And Christians today need to take control over their tongues. At the end of the day, Samson, again, is sleeping with the enemy and doesn't care anymore about what God has spoke into his life. There's something special that is with the believer. Unbelievers don't understand everything that we know or what we hear, and there's things that God may share with you in secret. I believe that God revealed to Joseph these dreams. It was a private dream. It wasn't for him to go and tell his entire family. And we reveal things oftentimes to the enemy. I, if, if I struggled in my workplace with lust... I wouldn't go to the woman flirting with me and say, by the way, I struggle with lust. Oh, she was going to say, well, good, I can get him. All i got to do is show a little more, and then we can go home together. This, there's a way of things that we shouldn't say to the enemy, that we don't have to tell all of our plans, that there's things that God tells us that is, that is for us. I share things with people I can trust. And there's people that you cannot trust, and they're going to share your struggles with other people. And the Bible tells us to confess our sins one to another that we may be healed, but you should only share those with people that you trust. Ultimately, Samson is going to give in his precious secret here. 
Verse 17 of chapter 16, it says, So he told her everything. She has pressed him. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. How precious. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. So she gets him drunk, basically, or sleeps with him, and he goes to sleep himself, and she has his head shaved. And the truth is that there's no magical power in Samson's hair. His strength is miraculous. It came from the Lord. His strength left because it was the last thing that represented his Nazarite vow to God. Now the dedication that he's been dedicated from his birth, even before he was born, now this dedication is fully broken. In Judges chapter 16 and verse 20 here, you see then she called Samson. The Philistines are upon you. This is the plot. She's tried to get this from him three different times, and he told her this would do it, and it didn't work. And this last time, the Philistines are upon you, and he, he woke up out of the sleep and thought, you know what? It says he thought this. We often think a way that we think, and we think we can overcome sin and doing things away from God. I will go out and do life just like I've always done. I'm going to shake them off. I've had these mighty battles. I'm going to continue as this mighty warrior for God. But it says here, he did not know that the Lord had left him. This is the saddest commentary in all of Scripture. That he felt in some kind of way that he could continue to step away from God and break his dedication and his vow to God and get away with it. And some of God's people today think that they can keep on doing life, uh, saying that they are Christians and do life like the world and not suffer consequences. We've seen great men who have done great work in church and pastors that have fallen. There are consequences for living in sin. There are consequences for giving up your vows to God. That's why the Bible makes it very serious when we give or make a vow with God. The Bible teaches us that the wages of sin is death. And that God is not mocked. Whatever you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption of the flesh. These things are destructive. And we think that, you know, well, it's not necessarily a sin. And there's things that God has called us to do and specific, specific things he's called us to. And maybe we haven't done them. And maybe there's something God has asked you to move out of your life. And you say, well, that's not that big of a deal. It's not a sin. And, and then we go down this path where our, our character is slowly corrupted. Everything that marked him as a Nazarite was now violated. And what happens? Then the Philistines seized him. They gouged out his eyes, they took him down to Gaza, binding him with the bronze shackles, and they set him to grinding in the prison. So now, Samson has gone from this mighty warrior of God, and now he is a slave to the enemy. They've gouged out his eyes, he can't see, he's just working here in, in, with the grain and all of that like any other prisoner. So Samson had a faith, he had wonderful beginnings. But it is utter failure in his life. But church, there's good news along the way. And with our God, there is grace and there is forgiveness. And you can finish strong. In chapter 16 and verse 22 and 28, you'll see here, but the hair on his head began to grow again as it had been never shaved. After it had been shaved, he's, he's working here and time begins to pass and and he's in this prison system, and Samson begins to review his life and think over these things of, you know, I've failed along the way. God gave me these great opportunities, and I had these successful battles, these wonderful wins, and, and I went down the wrong path, and I began to look at things I shouldn't look at, and go places I shouldn't go, and touch things I shouldn't touch, and, and give in to the ways of the world, and I gave up everything to the enemy. But it says here, he began to pray to the Lord. The good news about Samson is that he never rejected God or, or the faith. But he fell into sin, and we see that often with believers. But here it is. He cries out to God, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just one more time and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. This story of Samson is a tragic story. 
But you see tragedy throughout the Bible. The message of the Bible is that mankind, people are great sinners, but we have a great Savior. One who can take us when we may have begun in the faith and failed along the way, that we can call out to God and that we can have forgiveness in Him. And church, we can finish strong. And maybe you have gotten off a little bit in your faith, or maybe you began to drift and you had strong beginnings. I've had many people over the years say, well, my grandfather did this, or my dad did this, or we used to do this ministry. And I always like to ask, but what are you doing right now? And God is restoring us to bring us back to finish strong. And so he cries out to God and his faith begins to grow again. You should feel this stirring in your spirit. I want God. I recognize these problems and here it is. There is a rededication to God, a recommitment to him. The Philistines are having this drunken party in this temple of Dagon, their God, and they've brought Samson in to mock him. They're mocking their enemy. Look, we have the great Samson, and Samson has had this young boy lead him to these, these support pillars in this temple. And he begins to cry to God, God, give me an opportunity to stop my enemy one last time. And the Spirit of God comes upon him again, and he pushes these pillars down. That is the famous picture we see of Samson standing there in chains. One last opportunity to be the warrior of God. And Samson began with faith. Most of his life is utter failure, but he finds forgiveness with God, and he's able to finish as the strong warrior. Though the eyes, here it is, of God, through the eyes of God, Samson is recovered in his character. If you were to go forward in the scriptures in the New Testament, there's a book called the book of Hebrews. Chapter 11 is this wonderful overview of the people of faith in the Old Testament. And you will find that God breathed it out and inspired it that the writer would write Samson in there. His name is briefly in there, but the good news is this. I want you to see this. The very next chapter says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, everyone that was mentioned in chapter 11, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And church, that is our calling today. I'm going to ask our praise team to come. I'm going to ask you to stand as we prepare to close. Um, Our calling is not everything is necessarily a sin. And and maybe there's a sin in your life that needs to be dealt with, and maybe you need to come and pray about that. But there's many things that are not necessarily sins. They are weights. They are problems. They are things that are holding you back from running the race of faith as we pursue God together. So as we close, church, we're going to sing, Pass me not, O gentle Savior asking God not to pass us by, that we would find faith, that we would finish strong. So let's come and pray, church.